And uh, here we go. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, mysticism, mystical traditions, and related traditions. Uh, I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and we've got a, a show I'm, I'm super excited about tonight with a guest that uh, I'm super excited to have back on the show uh, because it's been way too long. We have uh, Dr. Khalil Andani, uh, a uh, assistant professor of religion, uh, a scholar who studied at Harvard uh, with Islam studies and got his doctorate there uh you may know him from his sh uh, show with us introducing us with an overview to the ismaili tradition i'm going to link that show uh down in the show notes you should definitely check it out it's uh an incredible show with some incredible information in it now uh today this is actually our 2021 Easter special. Uh, I really wanted to do something special for Easter. We've really covered a lot of topics over the years. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of look at um, a related tradition, a tradition that, that really uh, carries the gnosis in a very vibrant living direct way with no interruptions unlike my tradition uh, and that is ismaili islam and we're going to be talking a bit about the the crucifixion and uh, the role of jesus within that faith uh so sorry i i introduced you but i didn't say hello <laughs> hello dr Handani. hello uh, it's good to see you and uh i'm glad to be back and uh, you have not aged since the last time i saw you on here <laughs> You're too kind, but right back at you. So the, the gnosis keeps us young. Uh, so uh, before we get into this fascinating interview, unfortunately, I have to do something that I hate to do, which is beg you for money. Um, we are listener and viewer supported. We uh, actually do need a, a budget to do the show, to run the show, and that comes from our viewers and listeners. So you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash gnostic you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you can also put a cap on that in case uh, we do a lot of media that month if uh you're uh want to do a one-time donation you can do paypal.com slash gnostic and if you're unable to help us out financially we completely understand especially during these bizarre times uh you can also help us out by liking and subscribing by giving us a good reviews on the podcast catcher of your choice by telling people about the show by sharing it on social media by taking your favorite episode which is probably going to be this one and just emailing it to to somebody you know okay the commercial is over uh, dr andani we'll get right into it here now i know this is a a question that that you as a scholar and something as a, of a public scholar uh probably get a lot maybe you're sick of it but a, a lot of people are, are probably surprised to find out that jesus plays an important role in islam generally and in ismaili islam specifically can you talk a little bit about his role and i know this is a huge question that we could do a whole show on but if you could do your best to, to talk about his role and and some of the muslim understandings of jesus which of course uh you know the islamic world is is not not hegemonic there's a lot of variety of in there but if, if you can tell us a little bit about the role of Jesus across some different Islamic thinkers and groups. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm most happy to do that uh, with you. Um, so, yes, it, you're right. It would be a surprise, uh, you know, to many uh, to many people that Muslims, you know, believe in Jesus. Muslims revere Jesus, and uh, the the difference, of course, being is that Muslims do not view Jesus as God. But Muslims certainly affirm that Jesus was a messenger of God. Uh, he was a prophet of God. And therefore, uh, the idea that Jesus came with a divine message and a divine mandate, the idea that Jesus held divine authority, uh, this is all very, very important. And I'll quickly show something uh, on the screen because I think people sometimes misinterpret what it means when Muslims say that they say they believe in Jesus as a prophet. The word prophet in our culture is associated with almost like a, a fortune teller, you know, someone who can tell the future. But in Islam and in the Quran uh, more generally, uh, a prophet or a messenger of God is a person who carries divine authority. 
uh, there's a whole Quranic narrative about prophets. Uh, they, they perform many, many special duties. I've put some of these on the screen. And they're not just postmen, right? A prophet is not just a mailman. You know, a mailman brings you something in the mail, but he doesn't know what he's brought you. He just He's just a delivery service. But in, in Islam, generally speaking, uh, that is, you know, this is shared among different Muslim groups. Uh, prophets are very special human beings. Uh, they are protected by God from committing sins. They don't just deliver divine guidance. They embody that divine guidance. And they are um, they are chosen by God. They are, uh, you could say, the objects of divine election. So, so the Quran speaks about prophets very generally, uh, but it names prophets. And I've put a couple of verses of the Quran on the screen here, which you should be able to see. And you notice that among the prophets, uh, Jesus and is explicitly named, mm -hmm. uh, but not only Jesus, right? Uh, some of the names here you guys will recognize. Uh, you have Abraham and Noah and Moses. And uh, the Quranic word for God choosing in Arabic also uh, comes from the word of uh, for purification so these prophets are seen as as sort of pure humans uh they are enlightened uh self-realized human beings so th that's it from a very you know general uh muslim perspective and now if you go to jesus specifically uh the quran has certain special things to say about him so the virgin birth of jesus is retold in the quran uh his mission to the children of israel is affirmed in the Quran, which, which of course you also find mentioned in, in the gospel. And to, to get a sense of, of what the Quran has to say about Jesus, again, I won't read it, but I'm going to put the Quranic verses on the screen. So this, what you're seeing in the blue, uh, this is sort of part of the uh, Jesus birth story, uh, the what we call the, you know, the Annunciation as it's known in the Christian tradition. So in the Annunciation, uh, an angel tells Mary uh, that she will give birth to Jesus. So th there's a, a, a retelling of this in the Quran. Uh, and what we're reading here is the Quranic Annunciation. And it describes the mission of Jesus. So that he will be given the divine writ, the divine wisdom, the Torah, the gospel. He will teach that to people. He'll perform miracles. Uh, and there are some miracles about Jesus that are mentioned in the Quran that are not mentioned in the you know in the christian gospels although they are mentioned in some of the post biblical literature like the infancy gospel of thomas talks about jesus uh making uh the shape of birds right and then he just blows them and they come to life uh you you may have read that uh the quran the quran retells that uh, you can see it in the text there so, so it's very interesting, and uh, people have debated. Well, why is that material in the Quran? Um, some have some Christians, unfortunately, look at something like this with a little bit of derision. They say, "Well, why is the Quran re retelling, uh, you know, uh, apocryphal stories?" Uh, but, but, but people who say that, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, they might be missing the point of what the Quran is trying to do. Uh, when the Quran retells a story, especially about Jesus, it does so as part, as the premise of an argument that it's making. Uh, the Quranic argument being that Jesus is a prophet of God, he's a special human being, but he's not divine. Hmm. He's not God. He's not God in the flesh. Uh, he's not the eternally begotten Son of God. So the Quran takes a position against that. It is claiming to to offer a correct theology of Jesus, um, so that's why those stories are sort of if you if you sort of read the text here when it narrates uh, a miracle like I create for you out of clay as the likeness of a bird, and then I'll breathe into it and it'll be a bird. But notice the the, the words here by the leave of God. Yeah. So in the in the Christian. Uh, account or i would say you know not in the bible the post-biblical account of these stories jesus seems to do miracles independently yeah the quran adds this gloss by god's permission 
to these. So it's just making a different point. It's saying, yeah, he did this, but it's God who empowered Jesus. Jesus is not an independent uh, divinity. So this is just the Quranic uh, perspective. That, and, and all Muslims will affirm this. Now, once you sort of get into the weeds, as they say, we will find more nuance and more specific interpretations of Jesus and his theological status uh, within particular Muslim communities, such as the Ismailis, and there we'll, we'll get differences. Right. Well, th that leads in quite well to, to my next question. So uh, my particular denomination within the Gnostic world is, is the Johannine uh, tradition. And we particularly look to, to the Gospel of John in the Canonical Bible, as well as the Gnostic scriptures. And we actually do see the Gospel of John as, as being a Gnostic text. But the Gospel of John opens up with a, a famous poem talking about that Jesus is the Logos. He's the first creation or the emanation of God. He's God's wisdom and intellect. And really the first cause that leads to the creation of the world. Is this in any way similar to how the Ismaili understand the person of Jesus? And and sorry, this is a, I've got a few questions packed in here. And uh, um, the, the ancient Gnostics, they also believed in a cycle of prophets, which all contained the same logos as Jesus did. Is, is this idea found in Ismaili Islam? Uh, I mean, not the exact idea, but there's certainly, uh, I would say, uh, correlative ideas, uh, parallel ideas like this. Um, so uh, I can I can sort of show you uh, one question. I want to quickly ask you, uh, John, um, if you use the Gospel of John, most uh, the poem that you know the opening that you that you that you cited. Uh, most Christians, of course, see support in that for Jesus as, as you know, this eternally begotten uh, hypostasis, yes. right, within the Godhead. Uh, how, how does your church understand the theological meaning of that opening? I'm just curious to know, and I'm sure other people are too. Yeah, that that's a really good question because we have um, low low dogma. So uh, we use the, the similar symbol sets, we have the traditions and we have the texts, but we, we don't necessarily in, in our tradition within our church have definite, precise interpretations given by our leaders, right? So we do have some contradictions with using the Gospel of John as a Gnostic text, understanding it in what you may think of big G Gnostic, right? Uh, because we are talking about uh, uh, Jesus in some ways being the creator of the world in that that opening passage. Um, I would say that, you know, that was probably added on later, which is what a, a lot of scholars of the Gospel of John believe. And there are some indications within the Gospel of John that the, the Demiurge is sort of hidden in there, and perhaps later redactors picked up on that and they attached this poem at the beginning. All that said, uh, Dr. Andani, I think it still works. We can still uh, mush it together in some symbolic ways. One is, I, I think a lot of people would read that poem and they would understand that, that, that the Logos is secondary to the First Father right? Uh, so is not co-substantial with him, uh, is in some ways a very important aspect of divinity, of the, of the Godhead, but is, is a secondary emanation. And if you're going to try to, you know, kind of mash these together with uh, perhaps a, a more traditional Gnostic myth, well, you would kind of look at the logos as this first emanation and containing everything that should be in the world, right? The platonic ideal is there. And perhaps when creation actually happened, uh, you know, in the Gnostic view, things get a little bit messed up. Does any of that make sense? No, I, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so, so I'm getting from you that you don't really have a trinity, right? You don't have any consubstantiality between the logos and what you called the the father, the first father. Would that be correct? Well, and here I here I go uh, sticking my, my foot in the mouth in my mouth. I should also say, even though I am a deacon, I, I as I said, we uh, I don't speak on behalf of the church. So we we do use trinitarian language, and we do have a understanding of the Trinity, and we have the uh, within our. Um, uh, our, uh, we don't have doctrines, but we have 10 organizing points, right? Uh, and within that, 
we we mentioned that we understand divinity uh, through a Trinitarian structure, but we leave that up to individuals to to understand. So, you know, honestly, in my humble opinion, not speaking on behalf of the church, that we do sort of run into problems because we are um, composed of some different lineages. We are composed of some different uh, Christian esoteric movements in our past that we're trying to bring together to to unite and to have our our members draw from that stream okay and when we do that I, I i do have to admit that sometimes you gotta you you have to be pretty open and flexible and you know maybe this lego block doesn't quite fit with this lego block also with some of the trinitarian stuff we're a sacramental church and we we follow the sort of strict rules that are laid down um in the Christian tradition for, for sacramentalism. And some of those do use Trinitarian language and it's kind of understood, you know, the sacrament, it may not quite work if you're not using that Trinitarian language. Uh, but that said, Dr. Andani, with, with this long rant, I, I would say that many people within our community, within our church, without speaking on behalf of the church, would probably have quirky interpretations of the Trinity that uh, perhaps mainline Christians uh, and more doctrinal Christians and perhaps historical Christians uh, would not agree with. Does that all, does that long rant make some sense? <laughs> no, it, it does make sense. I mean, it sounds like in your tradition, there there's theological plurality. Yes. Uh, you know, um, there may be certain principles you agree on, but there's theological plurality. So that's interesting because the, the Ismaili Muslim tradition historically uh, has has basically functioned the same way. Uh, so now I'm going to sort of share my screen again for you. And um, what you have is sort of Ismaili theology, uh, like any theological tradition, it develops over time. Uh, more sort of like a snowball, you know, like a snowball just sort of get, layers are added over time. Sometimes you sort of clean the snowball and you change it around and, and you reshape it, but then it keeps growing. Um, and, and this is how actually, you know, theological, even one single uh, theological tradition within a Muslim community will work. So uh, the essential principles that basically all Ismailis subscribe to across time and space, historically speaking, would basically be, you know, the absolute oneness of God, the prof the prophetic mission of Muhammad, uh, the revelatory inspiration of the Quran, uh, the uh, imamate or the imamath as the divinely ordained uh, institution that succeeds Muhammad, uh, the idea that Islam in its scripture and its ritual has an esoteric meaning. Uh, th this is all sort of present throughout uh, Ismaili thought. Uh, however, those principles have been unpacked in the form of theology in different ways. Uh, when we look at that, um, we do find, and this is just a matter of history, there, there is a sort of more or less dominant theological model in Ismaili history. In other words, there seems to be a particular theological model that had more continuity that lasted centuries uh, as opposed to other models. And uh, that dominant, the, the historically dominant Ismaili theological model uh, was basically a Neoplatonic model, a Neoplatonic metaphysics, theology, and cosmology. And um, other, I mean, there have been other models, but those were not sort of held by most Ismaili scholars. Even when, when uh, Ismaili scholars stopped elaborating on the theological model itself and addressed related topics, that Neoplatonic model was still the scaffolding for, for whatever else they were talking about. So they could be interpreting a ritual or interpreting the Quran, and they would still make reference to, to Neoplatonic hypostasis. So, uh, so for that reason, um, what I'm going to share here is this Neoplatonic model, because that's really the theology in which an Ismaili Christology would, would be situated in. Uh, that being said, I should, I should just say that in modern times, uh, and, and we could have a different conversation about this, but in modern times, due to various internal and external forces, um, you know, lay Ismailis 
uh, tend not to really participate in uh, theological reflection in a systematic way. So uh, while there are certainly Ismailis in the present day community who continue to do theological reflection and they work within this Neoplatonic model, um, there are, I, 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 I don't have numbers, but you know, your, your, your lay Ismaili may not even have heard of this. He or she may be like, oh, I didn't like, you know, what religion or what religion is this in a sense? Uh, so, and, and I think this is true for many communities. I see it in, in other Muslim communities. You know, many Sunni Muslims don't know their own theology and so on. So I, when I present this, I don't want your audience to think that I'm speak. I'm giving sort of the opinion of, of members of the Ismaili community because I'm not. But I think what I'm conveying is, is an accurate account of the historically dominant form of Ismaili theology. Right. Even if today it, it, it has sort of been neglected, you know, by, by, by people for various reasons. So um, in this model, um, and, and again, this is important because this becomes the background to the, to the Christology, but it's also important because uh, you're going to find a lot of resonance uh, coming from your background. I think your, your church members will find resonance in this. So to begin, um, you have this notion of God, uh, which in in Ismaili thought overall, and especially in Ismaili Neoplatonic thought, God is absolutely simple, unconditioned reality, right? right? So this, this reality, it is ineffable, it's indescribable, uh, not because it, it is inert, not because it lacks, it, it lacks value or, or it lacks quality or it lacks reality, but rather because it is like this overabundance of reality. Uh, you know, so therefore, um, our descriptions, even even the classical divine attributes like the most wise or the most knowing, these fall short of uh, of depicting uh, the absolute reality of God. Uh, so what we're talking about here is we're not really we're not talking about a person, a personal being with with emotions or with personal states of volition or anything like that. We're talking about this absolutely unbounded, uncaused, necessary, you know, non-contingent uh, reality. And uh, there's an entire Ismaili discourse of, of double negation. So you would say, you know, God is not knowing and God is not not knowing. Yeah. Uh, as the most adequate way of speaking about, about this reality. And um, this, of course, is probably has something in common with, with, with I know many Gnostic traditions also subscribe uh, to, to something like this. So this, this, this principle, if we want to call it that, or, or this reality, it, it's absolutely simple. Uh, but it is also the ultimate explanation for anything that exists. Right. Right. So it, it's, it's the principle of existence. Uh, everything depends on it to exist. And even today, uh, there continue to be uh, theologians from many traditions, especially the Catholics seem to be ahead of, of everybody in this. Uh, but people continue to offer cosmological arguments, you know, to, to logically ground this idea. Uh, so this is, it's not, it's not really an exclusively a smiley idea. You'll find this in, in every religion. So, uh, this reality is the unconditioned reality, and it is the the ground, uh, the the ultimate ontological support for anything else, which would be contingent realities. Uh, and um, of course, it goes without saying. In this view, God is is beyond time and space, so we're talking about an uh, an eternal eternal reality, but not eternal in the sense of lasting forever, which is a common mistake people make. Uh, people think eternal just means everlasting, but it can still change. But here, um, God as unconditioned reality is timeless, yeah. so changeless, in, you know, uh, ineffable, this sort of thing, impassable. And uh, the term that the Ismailis give to the, the act, the creative act of this reality, which is an eternal creative act. So God as unconditioned realities, in a way that we cannot fathom, is supporting and maintaining everything else that exists, including you and I. Not directly, but ultimately. So the Ismailis refer to this sort of ontological relation 
uh, between God and everything other than God, they refer to that sort of divine creative act of of maintaining being, of granting being. They refer to that as the command or the word of God. Of course, the, this terminology is is analogical, right? It's not a verbal word uh, or or a verbal command per se, right? But it, it's it is a it's an eternal divine creative act. So from our perspective, it's ongoing. It's not something that happened in the past. So we're talking about an eternal act of creation, which is hard for many people to get their head around, uh, but there's nothing logically contradictory about that. And um, the, the Ismaili belief then, in accordance with Neoplatonism, is then that the unfolding of contingent reality from God's command or creative act, that unfolding takes place hierarchically. So the direct product of God's creative activity, the, the direct, the eternal effect of God's eternal act is the universal intellect, the noose in, in Neoplatonism, which uh, at this point, um, I should point out that the concept of the universal intellect for the Ismailis has likely a lot of overlap with the concept of the logos in in Christian Gnosticism, but also the concept of of the 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 uh, begotten Son of God in in the more sort of you know the Roman Catholic form of Christianity and the Orthodox uh, theology of Christianity, right? So there's an overlap here, and like what you said, you refer to Platonic forms being in the first in the first emanation. So for the Ismailis as well, the universal intellect. Uh, because it's contingent, it's not God. It's an effect, right? It's the first effect. So the universal intellect is not absolutely simple. Only yeah. God is absolutely simple. The universal intellect contains uh, what we could call a virtual multiplicity. So it's sort of like multiplicity, but still fused as one reality. Mm -hmm. But the multiplicity is, is there. It's potential or it's virtual. Uh, so the content of the intellect is the eternal necessary truths, which could be platonic forms, right? So perfect justice, perfect compassion, um, mathematical truths, which, which you know, many, many mathematical Platonists believe that numbers and theorems are eternal. Uh, also like ethical and moral truths for those who believe in objective morality, that's sort of timeless, you know? So if we believe that, compassion is a timeless virtue it's always true even if no one believed in it that would exist in the universal intellect uh, from an islamic perspective what we commonly call the divine names so in scripture god is named by many names you know the the all merciful uh, the just the knowing the living the powerful the wise so from an ismaili perspective those divine names which are multiple uh, they are grounded in the universal intellect. They, they okay. would properly apply there. Uh, and then from the universal intellect, there is an emanation, an auto-emanation. So the universal intellect does not emanate intentionally. It emanates out of its very nature. It's almost like the universal intellect is perfect, and a truly perfect being uh, is self-giving. I'm sure you've heard this, this sort of thing before. Yeah. Uh, so the universal intellect almost has this ontological surplus. It emanates this being called the universal soul. And, uh, you know, the universal intellect, of course, it will serve as the formal cause of all the qualities that we see in, in the cosmos. Uh, uh, but the universal soul has a particular role to play uh, because it's not perfect. It's uh, since it's separate from the intellect, the universal soul has sort of like an element of imperfection ontologically speaking it's more complex than the universal intellect and uh according to the, the neoplatonic story in a sense uh the universal soul wants to actualize perfection within itself but in order to do that it has to act it has to work you know and the work of the universal soul is what we would call creation uh and that creation is multi-layered so there's uh, one aspect of the universal soul's creation is to sort of it 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 uh, produces prime matter and it projects forms 
intelligible forms into prime matter, but the universal soul also uh, manifests as individual souls, uh, which are, people call them parts of the universal soul, but I, I like to see them as like microcosms uh, of the universal soul. Like fractal. Yes, fractal. Fractal is a good is a good analogy. So, um, so you have this sort of emanation from the universal soul, but one part of that emanation, one dimension, is material because you have prime matter, uh, and the other the other dimension of that emanation is spiritual, but multi but leading to multiplicity. Right. So there's a lot of sort of. I mean, it, when you think about this, if you sort of sit back and think about this, there's what we're seeing is sort of like the manifestation. Of a certain quality, but towards multiplicity and towards finitude. Right. right. As you go down, things become more and more limited. Uh, you don't have, unlike the, the Gnostic story, you don't have the explicit creation of evil here. Yeah. But you do have privation. So the universal soul, compared to the intellect, it suffers from privation to a certain degree. Uh, and similarly, prime matter prime matter compared to the universal soul, there's a privation there. Uh, so this is what happens. But the, 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 the purpose of this, this creation is goal directed. Uh, that's what, as I would, I've, I've written that there. So the universal souls work, it's goal directed, right? It's to achieve perfection. It wants to achieve perfection. Uh, the universal soul also is not within time, uh, as we understand it. Uh, but it contains time. It's almost like what we call time from an experiential perspective. Uh, I call it psychic time. People have different terms, but subjective time, uh, what we call subjective time that we experience, you know, which is different when you're having fun versus when you're bored. Some of your viewers right now think I've been talking too long and, and maybe a couple people think this has been too short. So that's what I mean by subjective time. So subjective time is the very experience or the activity of the universal soul, yeah. All right? So no, we're not at space time yet. Uh, but then from, from this level of prime matter and, and individual souls, we get the cosmos, what we call the world, which is, you know, the physical world proper. Uh, so, so this is the cosmology. Now the Ismailis sort of, all the Neoplatonists believe in this up to this point. And I should add that, uh, very neoplatonists of various stripes ismailis included they did not uh believe this cosmology based on faith rather uh this cosmology every level of it was affirmed uh because it was it is believed that there are certain features of the cosmos as we experience it that can only be explained by the existence of these principles so I should I should really emphasize that uh, it is common today for analytic philosophers to make similar arguments, but what anal what Christian analytic philosophers do is they take the actions and the qualities of all three of these God, intellect, and soul, and they just lump it into one entity, which they call God. Yeah, right. So they make God the the archetype or the foundation of existence, of qualities and forms, and of goal-directed activity. Like they, they, they sort of lump it all in one, which is fine. I mean, that's one position to take. Uh, but, you know, the Neoplatonist would say for, for good reasons that God alone cannot be the the arche or the, you know the foundation for all of these things because that would make God multiple. Yeah. And and a God that has multiplicity is composed of parts is caused by those parts and that would necessitate another reality beyond that God to 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 bring those parts together and so on. Uh so so there are good sort of there are reasons to hold this framework independent of religious belief or revelation you know there's cosmological arguments behind this now what the ismailis say is uh they say that in this cosmos that is the direct sort of it, it is the emanation from the intelligible world i.e you know these principles you have this cosmos now uh you have a type of human 
who is fully actualized. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they call it the perfect human. And this human effectively is a mirror of the universal intellect and the universal soul. Mm. And among other humans, this perfect human plays the role of the universal intellect in the intelligible world. So the, the universal intellect is to the intelligible realm that you see here, what the perfect human is to the human race. So Ismailis identify, they say that there was always at least one perfect human who is lives within the human race at every time period, at every moment, there has to be this perfect human. And if he did not exist, or if she did not exist, then the cosmos would sort of be in disorder because the universal soul would have would be failing for one moment to accomplish its task. So the perfect human has been identified in the past with these prophets. Hmm. So Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Prophet Muhammad, and many prophets in between. Uh, they, the Ismailis identify all of these prophets as the perfect human, which speaks to something you said earlier, right? You said that even the Gnostics believe in this sort of series of prophets manifesting a logos. So you have this thing with the Ismailis as well. Um, the great prophets, they are the human mirrors of the universal intellect and the universal soul. Right. Uh, and actually, sorry to interrupt, uh, the, but I just remember within our liturgy, we have a, a, a quote that, that goes back to Jesus, uh, either from the Gnostic scriptures, or I think it might be a, a free-floating uh, lo uh, logion, uh, which is, uh, I am a mirror to those that seek me. So it's, it's quite interesting to see you use the, the, the language of mirror uh, in the perfect human. So just sorry. <laughs> So I don't throw that out there as an interesting parallel. No, it, it's it's a very it's a very good point, and I use the word mirror here intentionally uh, because uh, lest lest they be accused of being incarnationalist. Yes, right. The Ismailis yeah. and and the Sufis who who also believe in a sort of similar structure of reality, the Ismaili Muslims and the Sufi Muslims, they were very clear. They said uh, Jesus, as well as the other perfect humans they are the mirrors of the divine names right keeping in mind the divine names exist at the level of the universal intellect not at the level of god but the jesus and the prophets prophet muhammad for ismailis the imam of the time so even the living imam of the ismailis uh who today for the nizari ismailis the living imam is his highness aga khan the fourth known as shakarim al husseini so for the Ismailis, the Imam of the time is the mirror. He is the perfect human, and he is the mirror of the universal intellect and the universal soul. But mirror does not mean incarnation, right? Uh, there is no sort of ontological indwelling of the intellect and the soul in the person of the prophet or the Imam. Right. Rather, there is a reflection. Just like, you know, if I take something any object and I hold it in front of the mirror, what you see in the mirror is the image of it, but it doesn't materially enter the mirror. So you have the, the transcendence of God, definitely, because in this process, God does never becomes directly manifest anyway. Uh, but even the universal intellect and the universal soul, uh, they do not materially or ontologically, you know, interpenetrate into matter or anything like that. Uh, it's only their reflection, i.e. Their, their forms or attributes, they are reflected in the perfect human. And of course, the perfect human, whoever, whatever historical person you identify him with, um, the perfect human has a soul and a body as yeah. well. So the perfect human still has a real individuality. So the person, you know, the, the person is that exists at the human level. The intellect and soul are not persons, right? They're not individuals with wills and tastes and, and likes and dislikes. So the personality of Jesus would still be the human person, just like the personality of Muhammad would be that human, or the personality of the Imam would be the, the you know, the human being. But these human beings are, because they're mirrors, uh, they are said to be pure. They're they're you know very clear, shiny, you know polished mirror is a common term we hear. 
So the soul of Jesus is a polished mirror. Uh, the soul of Muhammad is a polished mirror. The soul of the Imam of the time is a polished mirror. Uh, what that means then is that their followers, when their followers contemplate them, it's completely natural for the follower of Jesus, for the disciples of Jesus to behold Jesus and to perceive the divine, the manifestation of the divine names within him. Right. It, it, it's completely expected. So when Thomas says, is it Thomas who says in the gospel of John before Christ, he, he says, my Lord and my God. Yes. So, so take that statement or take, uh, Jesus makes other statements in John, right? He says, you know, I am the light of the world and I am the bread of life and I am the resurrection. You know, the I am, which you know way better than I do. Uh, so Ismailis would look at, you know, and Ismailis who subscribe to this theological worldview, and I don't know how many there are uh, there are today, but the, the theologically literate Ismaili can easily read the Gospel of John and contextualize the, the, the seeming claims to divinity that Jesus makes uh, within this, uh, what I would call a mirror, mirror Christology. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, uh, and, and I can, and I do know actually that, that some, um, some Ismailis and, uh, some Sufis did, did read and use the gospel of John and that this would have been the interpretation that they would have lent to it. And I could see how that interpretation, uh, goes quite well. And, uh, in some ways this is, uh, more sophisticated than, than a lot of Christologies, right? Uh, which, um, uh, I would say, uh, that, 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 that many have without you know being too critical and and kind of reminds me of perhaps some of the christologies that were found in the early days of, of christianity where it was quite diverse and there was a much more theological speculation on on the nature of jesus and this is reminding me of some of those views which were later uh labeled as as heretical so there's actually one modern christology which is very close to this uh so uh, Keith Ward, Professor Keith Ward, I think he's emeritus now, but Professor Keith Ward, uh, he has written a book called Christ and the Cosmos. I think that's the title of the book. And in that book, he, he offers a sort of reinterpretation both of the Trinity and uh, Christology. And I mean, he didn't use the terms Neoplatonic, but his remodeling of the Trinity sounds very, very Neoplatonic. You know, uh, he, he almost defines the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, in what, what we see here. And uh, his Christology is one, you know, most Christ, the traditional Christian Christology, they say that the person of Jesus is the divine person, right? The, the eternal Son of God. In our model, it would be to locate the I, the subject of Jesus at this level, at the level of the intellect. Uh, and, 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 and that is the traditional view, but Keith Ward says, look, the word person in modern times doesn't mean what it used to mean back in the fourth century. So Keith Ward says a person by our, in our world, a person means, you know, an agent of, a free, you know, autonomous creative action, yep. right? A, a, a finite agent of, of creative action. So he says that the person of Jesus is the human person, right? The human, the human subject. Uh, but he then he does go on to say that the uh, eternal Son of God uh, finds expression through this human person. So it's a different type of Christology. But I'm not sure whether how much he's looked into Islamic thought. But his Christology, in different terms, is very similar to the, the Ismaili and the Sufi uh, Christology or prophetology. So I just thought that's interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to get that book and I'll have to get them for the show. And uh, while we still have the uh, this up on the screen, uh, just to point out, I think a lot of, of, of uh, people who are familiar with Gnostics or uh, Gnosticism or, or are practicing Gnostics are going to look at this and it's going to seem quite familiar to them. Uh, and it's also quite similar to... The, the Gnostics of the, the 19th century and the early 20th century, some of the, the first wave of restorationists that we have are um, 
lineages from. They had a, a much more, many of them had a much more simplified version of the Gnostic myth that was much more platonic, partly because they had less Gnostic material, but also many of them were trained, you know, in Platonism, Neoplatonism, which was, you know, pretty important part of universities then as of now, but particularly then. So uh, really this, this this cosmology, I would say, would have been held by uh, some of our Gnostic uh, lineages and ancestors from, from the 1800s. And, and early uh, uh, 1900s, as well as with perhaps some of, of what we think of of some more classical Gnostic myths from Nag Hammadi, there's still some some interesting parallels here, which of course we're going to find throughout. Uh, um, anything that's sort of touched by Platonism and Neoplatonism and combining with the Abrahamic uh, traditions. Um, the last thing I'll say too uh, about this Christology and this cosmology. You would also find it in the the, Rena the Renaissance, where uh, a lot of philosophers and thinkers are rediscovering Neoplatonism. Uh, there, there's sort of a, a stereotype about the Renaissance that it was it was the actual writings of Plato that kicked it off. But the 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 people at the time were much more excited about the the Neoplatonic thinkers, right? Which of course they're getting through Byzantium through the Islamic world, right? That's how they're discovering uh, 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 Proculus and Plotinus and uh, the rest of the great uh, Neoplatonic thinkers are, are through the Islamic world. Um, and they would have, I think, uh, uh, many of them would have had a very similar cosmology and a similar understanding of, of perhaps the Trinity and, and Christology is what we're talking about now. So, so very interesting stuff. Uh, okay, so I'm going through my questions here. Okay, so we, we sort of talked about the, the understanding of, of uh, Jesus' uh, divinity and humanity, um, the, his mission. Uh, so many mainline Christians, they see his, his death as redemptive, and this is actually the most important aspect of Jesus, right? It's, it's not his life and teachings, but actually his death. Well, many Gnostics, many modern Gnostics, will still leave some sort of role for a redemptive death or some sort of understanding, but really they understand him as an esoteric teacher of Gnosis. Well, where would the, the Ismaili uh, land? Uh, the, the Ismailis as well will they the ismailis as well see uh jesus sort of primary mission is to teach gnosis uh that being said um as a prophet uh jesus the ismaili view is that the prophets could not you know they could not teach gnosis in its direct pure form uh rather a prophet encodes gnosis in the form of symbols Right. Those symbols could be in the form of laws, uh, ritual practices, and also parables. So the the fact that that Jesus and we see this in the new in in the uh, New Testament as well, right? That Jesus spoke in parables to the public and yeah. sometimes you know to his disciples. So the I, this is very interesting because th this term parable it's also all over the Quran. So we read in throughout the Quran it says. Uh, here's a parable of this and here's this parable and here's that parable and God speaks in parables. So for the Ismailis, Jesus did convey Gnosis. That, that is his primary mission. But uh, apart from the elite, i.e. his disciples, uh, Jesus conveyed Gnosis uh, indirectly uh, in the, in the form of parables, you know, by telling these stories and, and speaking almost uh, cryptically uh, now, there, Ismailis do believe that these great prophets, such as Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, uh, while they spoke in parables, each of these prophets was accompanied by a deputy and, you could say, a, a complementary teacher. Hmm. Uh, and that deputy or teacher that person during the lifetime of that prophet that uh, this uh, their their complement uh the ismailis refer to this 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 figure as the the founder so there's the prophet and the founder uh the founder who accompanies each great prophet uh he teaches gnosis in a more direct form to the spiritual elite so to give you an example uh adam was the prophet and he spoke in parables in the forms of laws and, and, and parabolic speech and this sort of thing. But his son Seth was the founder 
and Seth disclose the inner meaning and the gnosis behind Adam's parable teaching. Right. Uh, with Shem, it was his son. Uh, with Noah, it was his son Shem. Hmm. With Abraham, it was his son Ishmael. With Moses, it was his brother Aaron. And and there would there was a founder with with Jesus as well. Now, what's interesting is that the the pre modern Ismaili philosophers, based on the information available to them, uh, said that the founder with Jesus was Simon Peter. Right, which which dovetails with the Catholic view of of Simon Peter, as because they see him as a successor of Jesus. Uh, but I, I think that uh, had had the uh, Ismailis had sort of the latest historical research available to them, what we can see now, uh, they probably would have seen uh, not Simon Peter, but Jesus' brother James, right. as as the founder. It seems like James played that role uh, alongside Jesus. And, and we know from, uh, I'm not saying this is agreed upon, but arguably uh, one can argue from the New Testament, from, from the church history that was, that was written later on, that the, the, uh, the leader of the Jerusalem church, which is basically the mother church in the first few decades that the leader of the Jewish Christian movement was Jesus' brother, James. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, there's an interesting sort of thing there. So Jesus' mission is to teach Gnosis, but he would have taught it in the form of symbols. Uh, but his deputy and his founder, whoever that was, whether it was Peter or James, uh, they would have been responsible uh, for conveying the gnosis and Ismailis, you know, they also held that there was an entire hierarchy of teachers. So others like John, for example, John is named in Ismaili sources, like the Apostle John, mm -hmm. as one of those teachers of gnosis as well. Which I think it sort of dovetails with with what you guys hold. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because the 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 founder profit uh, uh relationship that you're talking about would also be pretty close to the relationship that we would see between jesus and john yeah uh but it is interesting that the ismailis still uh, ascribe him as, as a teacher uh, of gnosis now i i we kind of covered this before but it's just where where i stuck it on the uh the question sheet here is is a, a question about the trinity and of course you know i already discussed the trinity we kind of we kind of touched on it but i'm bringing the, the chart back up what, would you be able to perhaps uh, look at this and sort of tack the Trinity onto it or have a Trinitarian understanding that would be, of course, not not quite like what the mainline Christians would have? But, you know, the the, the ultimate God, the absolutely simple, unconditional, unconditional reality as the Father, the universal intellect as the Son, and the universal soul as the Spirit. Do, do, am, it, it, am I just uh, spitballing here, or, or do you think that there might be something that, that is an interesting parallel? I mean, historically speaking, and I'm not an expert, but but from the the academic work that I've read just on the historical construction of the Trinity as a doctrine and and how what context did the Trinity come from? I don't think anyone can deny that that the the doctrine of the Trinity was shaped by this very Neoplatonic framework, not the Ismaili framework, but the the Plotinian. Yeah. the Plotinian framework. So uh, many scholars have, have noted this, that that the Trinity partially seems to be inspired by, by this hierarchy. Uh, we could call this a, tr a triad, perhaps. Um, yeah. So the Neoplaton it's a Neoplatonic triad, it's not a Trinity, but I think historically speaking, there's a very strong link that the Trinity is in part inspired uh, by the Neoplatonic triad. And I don't say that as, as sort of like uh, an argument against the Trinity. Uh, you know, I, ideas come from a context and it would be a genetic fallacy to say that just because we know the context that a, a doctrine is false or something. Uh, so I think, you know, I think you're right on that. Uh, now, the way that the Ismailis have this, and, and let me just add, and I, I may have already said this, but this Neo, this this framework, which I call it Islamic Neoplatonism, because mm -hmm. the Ismailis are not the only ones who believe this. Uh, they seem to be the earliest, one of the earliest Muslim groups to hold this as their theological structure. But I have noted that um, it 
it is adopted by by a few Sunnis in a veiled form, uh, mm. but there's also uh, the Sunni Sufis. So the Sufis are the, are the esoteric uh, orientation of Islam that was more dominant in the Sunni world. The Sufis adopt this framework. Uh, mm. You know, by by the the twelfth thirteenth century, Sufi thinkers who 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 disagree with the Ismailis about authority and all this stuff, but they adopt the same Neoplatonic framework. So you find this in uh, Sufi writings in, uh, in the Arab world, in Persia, in India. This almost becomes like the dominant model. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And I don't know when it sort of phases out, but you know, there are still today, uh, there are Ismailis today uh, who continue this model, and there are Sufis today uh, who continue this model. So Ibn Arabi is the name of the 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 probably the most prominent uh, Sunni Sufi metaphysician, and he's very well known for his his ontology, which is the idea that uh, God is pure existence. And, and everything is a manifestation of God. But even Ibn Arabi, with that ontology, he believe, he affirmed this Neoplatonic framework. Uh, he, 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 yeah, he worked with it. So this is, I, I don't want to use the word mainstream, uh, but maybe that might be the word. This is more mainstream than many, many people think today it would be. Like we think today uh, Neoplatonism is just some fringe little thing like, in, in different religions, but at, at one point it was in the mainstream of Islamic thought. But it, there's no trinity here, right? It's hierarchical. You also, th yeah. there's no consubstantiality. So notice that the top here, mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between God and the intellect is a relationship of God's creative command or God's word. It's not a relationship of emanation. Yeah. So there's a departure here from, from other forms of, of Neoplatonism. That being said, what one could do uh, if you were within the Ismaili tradition or the broader Sunni Sufi tradition, and if you believe this metaphysics, you could easily say that the esoteric meaning of the Trinity was always this. Yeah. You know, the, tr the Trinity doctrine being a, a parable version of this, and, and you could say that this was the underlying metaphysics, uh, you know, that that is behind the Trinity. Uh, so you could say that. Uh, but, um, you know, again, we have to be very clear. This in and of itself uh, is not the Trinity, no. right? There are some, you know, there are certain Christian thinkers, and I don't think there are many of them, who did conceive the Trinity in some ways that's, that have more in common with this. So I think of Meister Eckhart. Now, yeah. I've written on Meister Eckhart, and I have argued that he does see his notion of the Trinity as similar to this. And you know when I wrote the I, I wrote this two part article and and a whole bunch of Christians wrote letters to the editor and disagreed and then other Christians came in and agreed so there's a whole debate uh, even now on how to interpret mystical notions of the Trinity from someone like like Meister Eckhart so exactly and you know, afterwards uh, I'm going to have to message you to get a copy of that article because that sounds fascinating so and uh, before moving on and again when I was sort of babbling about uh, some of our quirky interpretations of the trinity and again I, I can't speak for everyone of the, within the community because yeah we have 10 organizing principles which we're all free to sort of uh interpret uh I I I would hazard a guess that many people in our community would probably have a platonic triad approach to the trinity similar to this that as opposed to perhaps the concept uh substantial uh, uh mainline version but of course just speaking for myself and what i've observed uh finally before i move on to the universal soul as both the creative agent and um, our souls being a fractal uh, reflection, a fractal element to contain within the universal soul. We kind of find this again within Gnosticism with Sophia, who is understood, uh, she's often talked about as the universal soul, that phrase is used to describe her. Uh, she is often understood to be the source of human souls, and she is also understood to be the source of the prime matter. Uh, and the cosmos and the world. So again, very, very interesting parallels. But of course, we're all sort of drinking from from the same well here. So as you said, this uh, now, which which seems very obscure to people, this Neoplatonism was once very mainstream, and many different communities uh, went and filled up their, that bucket from from the well. Um, 
So, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Andani, uh, what does the Quran say about Jesus' crucifixion? Uh, we're finally getting to, uh, this is the Easter special, we're finally getting to it. Well, what does it say about Jesus' crucifixion? And why do some interpret the verses as saying that Jesus was never crucified? Okay, that's a, that's a, it's a very good question. Uh, it's also very much a sort of can of worms question, but I'll yeah. try to be concise uh, on this. So uh, let me uh, bring something up uh, on the screen uh, from a, sort of a different, a, a different talk because I sort of recently had some di dialogues. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them, some dialogues with, with Catholics uh, about this topic. So, uh, most Muslims today in the Sunni tradition, because most Muslims are Sunnis, most Muslims today, if you ask them, you know, do you believe Jesus was crucified? They will say no. They will say no, we don't believe he was crucified. Most textbooks or educational books about Islam that describe Muslim beliefs, most of those will say that the Quran denies the crucifixion and that Islam denies the crucifixion. Uh, th of course, these are generalizations. Uh, it may be true for the majority, uh, but the, we have to firstly differentiate between what the Quran says literally uh, and how Muslims have understood what the Quran to say, okay. you know, based on their own interpretive frameworks. So let's begin with sort of like the Quran. So I would agree that if you read the Quran in a very atomistic sense, that is, you just look at a few, three, you just open it up and you just look at the two, three verses uh, like that. It's sort of like it, 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 today's TV shows are, are serial TV shows, right? Where you need to binge watch the whole thing from, from the start to end. Uh, if you start watching, you know, season three, episode two of Star Trek Discovery, you won't get the full story from just that one episode, right? Back in the day when you used to watch Friend, when we were Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Friends, you could watch one episode and you'd get the sense. So the Quran is a little bit like, like, like the former uh, on certain cases. So the Quran appears to deny the crucifixion and the, the verses that are often cited about this is this. So the verses are here on the screen. Uh, so if you just start reading at this point, you will read, as for their saying, so some group called their, they are quoted, they're saying, we kill Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God, end quote. Yet they did not kill him, neither crucified him. It was only made to appear so to them. Those who are at variance concerning him surely are in doubt regarding him. They have no knowledge of him except the following of surmise. And it says, it repeats again, they killed him not of a certainty. No, indeed, God raised him, Jesus, up to him himself. So, you know, the, the lay reader, I'm sure you're thinking the same thing. Yep. Well, look, the Quran says he wasn't crucified. Yep. You know, where's yep. the debate? Where's the debate? Right? That seems to be the straight reading of, of what of what you just read to us. So uh, without any context, that yeah, is, it, yeah. it seems fairly straightforward. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, we should, we could just go home now, right? Because uh, yeah. it's so it's so easy. Okay, show's over. There we go. Yeah. Right. So, 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 and this is where many people stop. Uh, but sort of let's, let's think about this. Um, so, what about all the verses before? Like, should we care about that? You know, so there's this chunk of text before this, and there's even more before that. And, and the reason why we need to look at what is before is that we don't know from this text the referent of they. Right. Because if we are, if we read the Quran hyper literally, it's not saying Jesus was not crucified, it's simply saying that some group referred to by the pronoun they it says they did not kill him they did not crucify him so who is they so to find out who they is we have to sort of scroll back up because now we read the quran people read the quran on on, on a web browser now I, I do that for research as well so we scroll up and we get some more context so again there's this group called them uh but you can read from what 
what is, you know, there's a story being told about some group. And first they are told, do not transgress the Sabbath. And they made an oath not to transgress the Sabbath, but they broke the oath. So that's a bit of a giveaway. And then it says this group of people, they killed the prophets. Uh, they said our hearts are, are uncircumcised. Uh, this group, uh, apparently they are unbelievers of some sort. And they slandered Mary. Hmm. So what we are to, to gather from this is that the Quran here is speaking about a group of people, uh, Jesus' contemporaries or people in Jesus' community, uh, Israelites, who uh, did not believe in Jesus and slandered his mother and claimed to have killed him. Right. All right. So we're talking about, you know, a group of sort of, you know, Jesus' enemies, basically. So that gives you a bit more context. Uh, so it's, if the prima facie, I mean, if you read it literally, all the Quran is doing here is that it's almost rhetorically replying to the claims of Jesus' enemies. Jesus' enemies would have said, we killed him, we crucified him, you know, ergo, this is a false prophet. And the Quran is saying, no, you did not kill or crucify him. God raised him to himself. So that gives you a bit more clarity. Uh, but what does that mean for, for like, so then is it saying that, you know, like, like what happened to Jesus then, right? So right. the Quran in two other verses tells us that actually it is God who caused Jesus to die. Okay. Right. So this is one example. So in this verse, God tells Jesus, I will cause you to die and raise you to me. And I will purify you of those who believe not. Again, that's now an intertextual reference to this group here. Right. There's a group of people who not only do they disbelieve in Jesus, but they're trying to slander him and his mother. And God is basically saying, I will purify you. I will clear you of these false charges. So here it's saying that God causes Jesus to die. And actually, we read throughout the Quran and other verses, we read other verses that say it is God who gives life and it is God who takes souls at death. Yeah. So the, in my view, and, and I'm not I'm not the, the, the person to invent this particular reading. There are other academics of the Quran who, who say this, too. Uh, many of them arrived at this independently from one another. Uh, but a more holistic reading of the Quran is that. Uh, the Quran, by when it denies that they, i.e. the unbelievers, killed and crucified Jesus, it's not denying, you know, the fact that Jesus died on the cross. It's denying their agency right. in the death of Jesus. It's saying that, well, although you thought you killed him and you're trying to take credit for, for killing him, it is really God who God is the one who who really causes Jesus to die. Right. It's almost like this is the divine plan mm -hmm. that Jesus is to die and you, you you know you people you unbelievers the enemies of Jesus that you really uh, have no right to make this claim that that you took his life. Now right. what's very interesting is if we read this intertextually with the New Testament, this is from the book of Acts. So this is Peter's speech in the book of Acts. This speech would have been, I mean, I don't know how historical it is from a critical perspective, but if you take it as it is, this is like the earliest Christian preaching in, in, or the Jewish, the Messianic Jewish preaching in Jerusalem. And Peter says to, I guess, to some Israelites, uh, this man, Jesus, uh, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death. So even in Acts, it's saying that although, you know, certain uh, Israelites put Jesus to death, Peter is saying this is by God's plan and right. foreknowledge. This would be a very familiar idea to, you know, anybody really familiar with most forms of Christianity as well, right? This is, it's God's will. And you could ultimately say that, you know, if you ask many questions point blank, you know, the, the, did God want Jesus to die? Was it part of his will? Then they would obviously say yes, right? 
Exactly right. Yeah. So the idea is that those who who uh, did not believe they didn't they did they, they those who were the enemies of Jesus and, and opposed him with violence and arranged for this to happen. You know, it would be you know Romans and whoever else was involved that they cannot contravene God's will. That God's will is still sovereign over whatever happens. So you know they did not foil God's plan. Uh, right. whatever that was that's the message so I, I think when you read the quran uh uh intratextually i.e you know correlate what it says in, in it's in it's in the text but then also intertextually with the new testament that is the message that we find instead of an outright denial of jesus uh, death and crucifixion now another important context uh, when reading the quran another intertext you could say is um the Talmud. Mm -hmm. So there is this rabbinical literature in the ba in the Babylonian Talmud, which uh, you know was was in writing in some form uh, before Islam came. Now some scholars are debating. Well, it w maybe it went through editing or something. But I mean, here's here's what we have in it. Uh, so there are are polemical claims against Jesus and Mary in the Babylonian Talmud. Um, Peter Schaefer has a book called Jesus in the Talmud where he talks about the passage. So it's interesting. Um, it says in there that firstly, they accuse Mary of being an adulteress yep. in this Talmud. Uh, and um, the Talmud claims that Jesus was put on trial and for, for sorcery or blasphemy 40 days before Passover and then stoned. And he was put on trial by the rabbis. That's what the Talmud claims. 40 days before Passover. And then it says that on Passover, he was hanged okay. on a tree, which is crucifixion. So yes. it's interesting because like in the in the Talmudic version of this, which is polemic, it's, all, it's not historical, but it's, it's polemic. There's killing of Jesus and then crucifying of Jesus, right? And there's yeah. also like an insult against his mother. So this is the subtext, according to many scholars, I agree with this. I'm not a Talmud expert though, uh, so I'll just keep that in mind. But many scholars, including, you know, Gabriel Said Reynolds, um, also uh, there's another scholar, Rick Oaks, who just did a dissertation on the crucifixion of, of Jesus in, in Islamic sources. And he too has, has talked about this passage. Um, so the Talmud is taking a position that, and it's a polemical, you know, boastful position that the Jewish authorities, they put Jesus on trial and they killed him according to Jewish law. Because, you know, in, in Deuteronomy, it says, like, you know, a blasphemer shall be stoned and then hung on a tree. That's like the ultimate disgrace. So it's polemics. So the Talmud is, is trying to sort of polemicize against Jesus and Christianity and so on. So I think that the Quranic verses that we just read, and I'm putting it back here, they seem to, like, fit the pattern of refuting the Talmud. So... The Talmud said Mary, you know, it insulted Mary, right? Oh, she's an adulteress. So the first thing the Quran says is they're, they're uttering a, against Mary a mighty slander. Yeah. Seems to match that. And then the Quran says they did not kill him and they didn't crucify him. Mm. Because the Talmud mentions two separate events. It's like they killed him by, ha by stoning 40 days before Passover, and then they crucified him. So I am, this is not absolutely certain, but it seems to me that the Quran in its milieu, uh, again, we're being very literal, right? I haven't shown any sort of mystical, mystical interpretation yet. Uh, you know, there's no Gnostic reading yet at this point, but the Quran, if read properly, literally, contextually, it doesn't deny the crucifixion. It's actually just denying the agency, the boastful claims, the polemics of certain certain rabbis uh, that we seem to also find in the Talmud. So, so that's just from a, a, a historical perspective. Now, I will say that many Muslims, uh, what they came to believe is that they read this without this context without the New Testament, without the Talmud, without this inter -Quran, intra quranic context either, they came to the conclusion that 
someone else was crucified instead. So that God t sort of made someone else look like Jesus, and that person was crucified, and that Jesus was raised to heaven mm -hmm. by God, and 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 he's literally in heaven right now in 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 his body. Uh, that's what most Muslims came to believe. That's called the substitution theory, but the evidence for that is primarily uh, a later set of Muslim literature called Hadith, mm -hmm. where not the Prophet Muhammad, but some companion of Muhammad uh, interprets this verse and actually tells a whole story about some someone else being made to look like Jesus and put on the cross. So a completely ex a, 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 a story that doesn't come from the Quran and it doesn't come from the Bible, but it may have actually come from certain Gnostic circles. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's some Gnostic texts talk about uh, Simon of Serene, the, the one who carries the cross. You know, Jesus does some, Jesus and God do some uh, some whamma jamma, and Simon is made to look like Jesus and crucified in his place. Now, as you can imagine, uh, as, as a Gnostic, uh, uh, it's not a story I'm, completely, I'm particularly fond of because it doesn't seem very uh, Christ-like. To uh, to get out of the crucifixion in that way with a, with an innocent guy. Um, however, there's also other Gnostics uh, 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 in the mythos that say uh, Jesus wasn't crucified because they were ascetic, right? Uh, Jesus uh, uh, doesn't have a, a human body in the way that we have human bodies, and he was only made to look like that that he was crucified. So it, it is quite possible that uh, that these ideas were circulated, in, and perhaps these later interpreters picked them up from the Gnostics for sure. And, and of course, that's not just you know, there's lots of different Gnostic ideas about the crucifixion with the different sects and within the, the different traditions and within the different scriptures. But those, those are two that seem quite similar to what you're, you're talking about with these, these later hadiths and these, uh, these later interpretations. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because today uh, many Muslim uh, you know, debaters and apologists are, are increasingly becoming embarrassed by, this, uh, by the substitution theory. You know, yeah. like what you, you you said it yourself that it's not really something you would you would go to bat with. So many uh, Muslims in the Sunni tradition who sort of come from a tradition of the substitution theory, they're sort of reconsidering this because, frankly, uh, it is hard to credibly defend in the era of historical criticism and and you know you know co attention to context and stuff like this. Uh, it's it's harder to defend. So now more Muslims are revising their position on this. Uh, and this sort of brings me to the next part. Um, well, I'll, I'll skip over this, but I'll just add, and I won't go over this, but there is, even among Christians, uh, in, you know, leading up to Islam, so in, in the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century, uh, the Byzantine, Nestorian, and Monophysite Christians are also having a debate over uh, what, dimension of christ was crucified and mm -hmm. put on the cross so actually i meant to skip this slide but since it's here so a, one an academic colleague uh, ryan elizabeth craig presented a couple of years ago at a conference and she talked about how it's actually christians who are also debating this issue because is the eternal divine son of god does that undergo death or is it just the body of jesus right so the humanity dies and the divinity lives or do both is both natures are crucified so there's a whole like debate intra christian debate yes uh, so she has suggested that the quran may also when it says everybody is at variance people are are differing over what really happened that the christians at that time uh could could be implicated in a sense by that verse because there's no consensus among Christians over how to square this because nobody wants to say that God died. Yes. Right? Uh, so so you have that too. Um, and, and there are certain Arabic Arabic versions of the Christian creeds that that, write, that this scholar uh, Ryan uh, Elizabeth Craig that she's talked about in her work, which I'm quoting here. I, I sort of quoted her, her handout that she gave uh, a couple of years ago um, at this conference that I attended. So so you can see it already in these quotes, right? Like, oh, the body died, but the the divinity did. I think that last monk is a Nestorian. So the Nestorians have it much easier because they, they have like two persons, two natures in Christ. 
So for them, it's very easy. Yeah, like the divine person didn't suffer at all. You know, it's just the human person did. No, you know, no problem. For for the monophysites, it's it's harder and so on. Yeah. Uh, now the um, the Ismaili view, which I can now shift to. So what's very interesting about this whole thing is that uh, while the substitution theory was the most dominant theory and for centuries within the Sunnis and the other Shia. Uh, the uh, Ismaili Shia have always affirmed that Jesus died on the cross. Hmm. This has always been the Ismaili position going, uh, going back to the earliest Ismaili writings we have on the topic. So, um, see, this I already went over. So this is a bit of a review for everybody, right? So, I, again, I want to differentiate between the Quranic perspective, which we can only sort of talk about in this sort of scholarly way, right? When you read the Quran contextually in the seventh century. So that's sort of one take. Um, and that's what I've sort of already gone through. And then now we're going to sort of the, the, the interpretation of the Quran after the time of the Quran among Muslim communities. So you have, that's where you have the substitution theory that I mentioned, mm -hmm. which is, seems to be inspired by Gnostic oral tradition of some sort, but the Ismailis never went along with the substitution theory because they found the whole theory absurd. You know, they they were like, clearly, you know, clearly this is not the case. Um, so the Ismailis went to the same verse and it seems like they were already, they were going like, they knew that the dominant position was to read this verse in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, you could already tell that. So they're sort of, they're not in a defensive position, but they're, this is a minority interpretation. So the Ismailis offered what you could call a, a different type of Gnostic reading of the Quran in this verse. So they said that Jesus has a human form, what you call a nasut, uh, and he also has a, a pure spiritual soul. And souls are eternal. Souls are generated by the universal soul. They're not material. They're eternal. You can't kill a soul. You just can't do it. You know, especially the pure soul of God's prophet or the imam or whoever the perfect human of the time is. You can't kill a pure soul. It's just, it's not a thing. Metaphysically impossible. So the Ismaili said that it's just the physical human form, the body of Jesus, and whatever the faculties of the body are, that was crucified. Right. But the soul of Jesus, which is, you know, the manifestation of God's names, that could never be killed nor crucified. Uh, there's an interesting reading that the Ismailis have done of this passage in one Ismaili text that I've seen. I don't know the exact dating. It could come from the late 800s, perhaps. Um, so notice how in the Quran, there are two names for Jesus. One is Al-Masih. This is Christ in, in English. And the other name for Jesus is Isa, which is Jesus. So two names for one person, right? Mm -hmm. So this one Ismaili text that I read, it said that when the Quran refers to Jesus, the person of Jesus as just Jesus, Isa, that refers to his bodily dimension. Hmm. And when the Quran refers to him by the name Christ or Messiah, that refers to his spiritual dimension. This verse mentions both names. Mm -hmm. And when it says, again, this is a sort of a Gnostic reading. And when it says, they killed him not nor crucified him, this singular him refers to Jesus spiritual dimension. So they did not kill nor crucify him in his spiritual dimension. And and this this author says if the Quran wanted to say that they killed Jesus in his totality, it should have said them. Like it should have it should have referred to the spiritual and the physical dimension by the plural. So that's a, that again, this is a Gnostic reading. It's, it's not a historical reading, but you see both these readings end up in the same place to affirm that Jesus was killed in his body on the cross. Uh, and, and to support that contention that somebody could die physically, but not die spiritually, 
the Quran says about martyrs, right? Those who are slain in God's way, think not of them as dead. Uh, mm -hmm. They live finding sustenance in the presence of their Lord. So the Ismaili said, Jesus is a martyr, clearly. So if, a, if, if generally a martyr is not dead, if you, you cannot call them dead, then Jesus as a martyr, certainly he, he cannot truly be dead in, in that spiritual uh, metaphysical sense. So this here is a quote from an Ismaili uh, theologian or philosopher he's writing in the uh, er, uh he's writing in the early 900s possibly the 800s late 800s and to prove that the quran affirms the crucifixion he quotes the bible mm -hmm. he actually says look in the bible jesus says that you know do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the spirit so Jesus himself differentiates between killing of a body and killing of a spirit. And so the Quran really agrees with the New Testament, with the gospel. And, and that's basically what he says here. And then he quotes the verse that I showed you earlier, where God says to Jesus, I will cause you to die. Right. So that sort of brings the whole argument full circle. So the Ismailis have always said, I mean, every Ismaili text I have read uh, in the pre-modern period, they all say that Jesus did die on the cross. And that sort of brings me to the next part of this. I think this is your next question, if you want to. It sure through. is. Yeah. But you know what? Let me ask it, even though it's already queued up, just for sure. fun. Because I, I did want to say, the Gnostic Christians, they focus a lot on the symbolic and esoteric aspects of the crucifixion and of the symbol of the cross itself. And I wanted to get that out there because probably our next Easter special, so 2022, or maybe this year, if I can do it as a mini episode of just myself ranting, uh, it's, it's a whole other topic. It's a whole other show, or at least a mini episode, just talking about how they understood uh, and how the different Gnostic sects understood the cross and the crucifixion in a symbolic way. So that that's a whole other thing. Um, but I understand that that there is at least some parallels between uh, Gnostic Christianity and uh, the Ismaili in this this understanding of the cross and the crucifixion. And, and actually, the second part of my question is: it, it has perhaps something to do with the famous Declaration of Faith within Islam. Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, and, and I have a couple of videos on this, um, but but it's nevertheless uh, of, of great importance. So not only do the Ismailis affirm the crucifixion of Jesus, but they, they see the crucifixion as a, a revelatory event of some sort. Uh, it's both a revelatory event and it's a parable in itself. You know, a parable for those who have eyes, the, the parable is a revelation of truth. And for those who, who are not at that level of understanding, it's just a parable. So the crucifixion, specifically the cross, is seen by the Ismailis as having this symbolism. So what we have here is uh, I have juxtaposed the four words of the Muslim profession of faith in Arabic, la ilaha il Allah, which literally means no God except God. This is negation followed by exception, right? It's like this phrase, like there's nothing except X. So it's like you're negating everything and then you're negating your negation by by way of exception so that statement in itself la ilaha illallah to become a muslim you have to you declare this statement like every muslim declared this statement they say la ilaha illallah and then they add muhammadu rasulullah the second statement means muhammad is a messenger of god so from a muslim perspective the first statement there is no god except god to be a Muslim, you have to link it. It has to be attached to the second statement, which is the mention of Muhammad, right? right? From an Ismaili perspective, the la ilaha illallah in and of itself is an allusion to the absolutely simple, indescribable nature of God. Because, you know, you can't describe God positively. So the, this shahada, la ilaha illallah, it's not really a positive description of God. It's almost like the negation of a negation, right? 
So it, yeah. it's a, and it's a mantra in that sense. So I can tell you that uh, there's a tradition among Muslims. I think it, it, I think, you know, it's very widespread when a baby is born, uh, people will whisper or chant or recite uh, la ilaha illallah into the baby's ear when the baby is born. And then also Muhammad the Rasulullah. And I can tell you that at funerals, when the uh, body of the deceased is being carried in a casket, carried to the grave, people are, uh, are chanting La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So this phrase is very, very important, uh, generally for Muslims as a form of piety, but then for Ismailis, it's symbolically important. It's as if the whole uh, Neoplatonic structure of reality has somehow been summarized, recapitulated in the Shahada, in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So here's how they talked about this. Um, they, they, they said then that if Muhammad brought this sort of theophanic symbol, la ilaha illallah, every prophet brought something like this. So they said that, you know, Adam built the Kaaba, which is the cubic structure uh, in Mecca today. If that was Adam's, it's sort of like, this is like an, an, an architectural parable. So like the Kaaba in Mecca is, what Adam brought. Uh, Noah's ark was constructed on this pattern too. Right. Right. Abraham rebuilt the Kaaba in Mecca. So that's his symbol. Um, then, you know, Moses had like the ark of the covenant, for example. Uh, Jesus, what was Jesus's architectural parable? It was the cross. So the cross is to Jesus what the Shahada is to Muhammad. And somehow the whole the whole structure of reality, the spiritual and physical cosmos, is symbolized in the cross, just as it's symbolized in the Shahada. Mm -hmm. So, so what Ismaili thinkers did is they they wanted to show this to to other Ismailis. So they juxtaposed the four words of the Shahada onto the cross, like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's sort of like the explanation. So, from a broad perspective, they said that. Uh, these two sort of lateral branches of the cross. Uh, well, let's start at the top. So the top of the cross, which symbolizes, you know, the highest point of reality, that is the universal intellect. And then these two lateral branches of the cross, uh, that represents the universal soul and the prophet. Mm -hmm. So what's happening here is in the Neoplatonic hierarchy, the universal intellect is... Uh, emanating intelligibles down the hierarchy. And at a macro level, those intelligibles are received by the universal soul. And at a micro level, they are received by the soul of the prophet. Right. But I also mentioned that, you know, that what will happen is the universal soul will receive the intelligibles, like in that other diagram, and it will uh, encode them into prime matter to produce you know, physical, physical things, right? To produce nature. Uh, so the intellect is, you could say, manifested first and foremost in, in the cosmos as nature. Uh, the prophet will receive those intelligibles, which are universal truths, right? The forms, mm -hmm. eternal truths, and the prophet will articulate them as language, as parables. Uh, that will become scripture, although when the prophet does it, it's oral. It's articulate. It's not written when the prophet does it, but it becomes scripture. For, you know, communities write it down. But I also, I also said that the prophet's mission is complemented it, as a necessary complement. The prophet is in, is accompanied by a, another figure called the founder or the the legatee. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, you know, James was James was you know most likely the the legatee with Jesus and Aaron was with Moses and Ali the first imam of the Shia he was the legatee with Muhammad so the legatee he receives both um, the sensory cosmic uh, forms that the soul the universal has created which is the world uh, and he also works with the parables articulated by the prophet, whether it's in the form of stories, rituals, laws, 
And what the legatee does, his role is to decode those and lead them back to the original archetypes mm -hmm. behind those parables and symbols. So it's sort of like emanation comes down, it takes on a form, but then the imam, the legatee, the founder, this figure, he, with the community now attached to the parables, he sends, he, he doesn't send it, but he leads all of it back to the origin. So that's what, the, you have that in the cross. That's the general idea. Um, and uh, one Ismaili thinker said that the cross is a symbol for, for, for this hierarchy, right? Like the whole structure of reality, it's, it's embedded in the cross in, in a symbolic way. So uh, Jesus was put on the cross. Just like the Shahada, the second statement, Muhammadur Rasulullah is joined to the first statement, the person of Jesus is joined to the cross. Right. So the symbol, in this case, the symbol of reality is explicitly attached physically or verbally to the prophet who, who revealed, who brought that symbol. Um, and, and this also foretells, you know, a crucifixion is a public event. Yeah. It's not a private event. And we could say that had Jesus not been crucified, I don't think anybody would know about him no. today, right? So the crucifixion of Jesus, all it, it's a strange irony, although it was meant to disgrace him and, and, and dishonor him and show him to be false, it had the opposite effect of actually revealing Jesus to the whole world. Like revealing his greatness, it's almost like the the you know you could say the the pre modern version of the what they call it the Streisand effect, where like you're trying to like su on Twitter, right? You're trying to suppress the this news item, and you just end up like amplifying it. So it, it, that's what the crucifixion did for Jesus. So the crucifixion then, in in the sort of like from a from a more sort of larger perspective a theological perspective is an act of revelation it, it's a revelatory event yeah yeah and uh that sort of brings me to, to sort of like the more detailed exegesis so what you have here what i've put here is the, the sort of like the simple exegesis of the cross and the shahada but you can sort of go into more detail so what they did is they uh looked at the shahada and they broke it down into its components. So it's one statement, la ilaha illallah. Mm -hmm. It's two parts. La ilaha is no God. And then illallah is but God. So that's negation and affirmation. It's made up of only three letters. So throughout this shahada, there's just three letters being repeated. Mm -hmm. What you would call A, L, and, and H. Mm -hmm. uh, it has four words. And those words together have seven syllables when you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And there's a total of 12 letters. Mm -hmm. So they broke this down. And then they said, well, let's look at the cross. The cross in its own way has a similar architecture to it. Uh, so the cross has one center point. It is comprised of two lines. It consists because the you know the cross is three D right. Uh, its its dimensions are lines, angles, and and planes. Uh, there are four branches as we can clearly see. Mm -hmm. uh, they talked about it having seven faces. So you know the one, two, three, four, four extremities right, and one you know the, sorry this part's in the ground. So one, two, three extremities in the air, and then like four, or whether you call these angles or valleys, so that's seven, like seven faces. And finally, if you count, um, you know, if you, if you sort of count all the different edges or points of the cross, uh, they did this, and I, this even worked with, with the, the Eastern cross, but you end up with like 12 edges or 12 points. Right. So they said, look, the same, the cross and the Shahada have the same architecture, and this is still at the outward level. And then they gave the the sort of spiritual hermeneutics or the spiritual exegesis. So the the oneness of the Shahada and the cross that represents the command of God. That's God's creative, eternal creative act. 
uh, and then the two parts are the universal intellect and the universal soul. The three letters or the three forms, you know, that is, Ismailis refer to sort of three sort of high spiritual beings that mediate the emanation of the universal soul called Jad, Fath, and Kayal. Um, then the four branches refer to this pair, intellect and soul, prophet and legatee or imam. The seven refers to the uh, a period of seven imams, which of course in Ismaili history, the seven imams keep recurring. So today, the current imam of the Ismailis Aga Khan the fourth, he's the 49th Imam. So he is the seventh Imam of the seventh Heptad, which is a very sort of big deal, you know, based on the cycles of seven. And then there's also this belief, I didn't talk about it, but there's this idea in Ismaili thought that every prophet and every Imam has 12 deputies uh, who convey gnosis on his behalf uh, to, to people of the world. What, you know, we, we often don't know the, who their names are, but this is this is this is the belief. So that's what you have here then. You have sort of this, uh, what you could call it a, a, a theophanic or, or hermetic uh, interpretation of the cross uh, and the Shahada as, yeah. as symbols of Gnosis. Uh, fascinating. And, and just the, the there's, there's of course not one-to-one -one parallels with esoteric Christianity or Gnostic thought, but the way of thinking is very, very similar. And it reminds me a lot of, of how the cross and, and other symbols are interpreted in the in the esoteric tradition. So so it's fascinating. But uh, coming up to to an actual one-to-one -one comparison, now I, I read an article, of course, that you wrote about the crucifixion in Ismaili Islam, and I was very happy to see that uh, you referenced the Gnostic Acts of John, or to be precise, the, the Acts of John, which doesn't seem to be a completely Gnostic text, has a Gnostic insert in it, which is literally known and has been published on its own as the Gnostic crucifixion. And within that text, they talk about the cross of wood and the cross of light. Uh, what is the cross of light? So that so I um I got this uh, I read this passage uh, in the the work of uh, Henri Corbin. Henri Corbin was one of the like you know earliest people to to write about Ismaili gnosis. I mean his book is called Cyclical Time and Ismaili gnosis, and um, you know f for me uh, I mean I'll be honest uh, when I grew up. Of course, I know who Ismailis are, and I know the basic beliefs, but I had no idea that Ismaili Islam had a, a, a gnosis, because like many people just don't talk about this, you know. Uh, it, um, many people in the non-Ismaili communities, Ismailis are just accused of of so and you know of, of sometimes heresy by certain people. Um, unfortunately, this has been a, 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 an issue over time. Uh, but the, today, because of this, the, the situation of modernity, we live in what Charles Taylor calls a, a disenchanted world. People, you know, lay smileys don't even know uh, what Gnosis is uh, until unless you are taught. And I, I just stumbled on this book by accident one day, uh, and and uh, my mother said. Uh, you know, Henry Corbin is very good. You should read him and so on. Apparently my mother, when she was a, a student in Paris, uh, she had taken classes with the students of Henry Corbin. So many, many years ago, I read this book and he made this connection. Uh, he said there, this cross of light that is mentioned in the Acts of John that this is directly connected to to Ismaili thought, uh, and and it connects in this way. So the Ismailis believe that the person of the Prophet, whether it's Jesus, Muhammad, and the person of the Imam, that although they're humans, uh, their humanity is an a reflection of a spiritual reality that is often described as light. Uh, the Arabic term is nur. Uh, so we, we hear this phrase in uh, Ismaili Islam, the light of the Imam or the nur of the Imam. The Sufis talk about the light of Muhammad or the nur of Muhammad. And the nur, which means light, it's a Quranic term. Uh, the God is described as light, but Muhammad too is described as light. And Corbin said that uh, the 
in Ismaili Islam, not only is is the Imam's spiritual reality this light, which which again neoplatonically that it would be the universal intellect and the universal soul, but that the souls of all the disciples, the, the spiritual initiates, they are joined to the light of the Imam and the whole collective together, i.e. the Imam's light combined or linked with the light of, of, of his disciples, uh, that entire st spiritual structure is called the temple of light, mm. which is a hierarchy because not all the disciples they're all different levels of, of intensity of light, you know, going all the way up to, to the light of the Imam. So Corbin said that the cross of light is the temple of light. And the idea here is that that particular text that I quoted, which Corbin first quoted, in that text, the historical Jesus was crucified. Mm -hmm. Right? Like in that particular text, uh, if I recall, uh, the cross of light is actually Jesus in his spiritual nature affirming and says, yeah, you know, they, they crucified my body and yet they did not crucify me. I mean, they, they could not crucify the light of Jesus, right? They crucified his body. So I just thought that that actually dovetailed directly with this Ismaili interpretation that I showed earlier, where it says, yeah, they crucified his body, but they didn't crucify his spirit. So to me, it was just a, it was a happy coincidence. I thought I should put it in there. And this issue of, you know, does, can the perfect human, you know, because the perfect human being, whether you see it as a, a historical prophet or an imam, uh, you know, many Ismaili imams in history were killed. They were martyred. Uh, many of these imams were persecuted. And other Shia communities who, uh, who follow some of the same imams as the Ismailis, those other communities continue to mourn the death of some of those deceased imams. The most famous one being uh, Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein for the other Shia, he's the third imam. For the Ismailis, he's the second imam. But Imam Hussein was martyred in a brutal massacre known as the Battle of Karbala. Right. This is, and this is something that that it, it, it is a it's such a sad and, and devastating story of injustice and persecution, where the imam and his family. There were a small group of seventy-two people. They were literally massacred by you know uh, by ten thousand, an army of ten thousand. Uh, and and the imam was killed, and 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 you know other Shia mourned this. Now the Ismailis today they don't mourn any of these deceased imams, hmm. like it just doesn't happen. And and a lot of people ask, well, why you know why aren't we mourning? And this is a dishonor to their memory. But the explanation given is sort of the same thing as the explanation of of the crucifixion of Jesus. That yes, the imams are killed. They may have been killed physically in their bodies, but the imam as a spiritual entity, as a mirror of this temple of light. Uh, in that sense, the Imam is always present and always living, and it doesn't really matter ultimately uh, what or who the physical person of the Imam is, because it, in the Ismaili view, there has been just continuity in the Imamate. So they, you know, people can try to do whatever they want, to any of the imams, the, the line of imam continues, the next imam is present. So the light of imamat is really the the principle that one should focus on. And, and that's the term that's used today, the light of imamat. And, and that seems, uh, at least to me, the same idea of the cross of light, right? So the cross of wood is perishable, you know, and so on, and people can mourn over that and 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 be upset about it, and certainly because it does happen. But for those with the eyes of gnosis, that cross of light is indestructible. 
exactly. Well, we are uh, running a little bit late, uh, and I really appreciate you joining us. And I know it's getting late where you are, but uh, one last question, even though I, I have some more on here. Obviously, I find this fascinating, and we, we could go all night. But um, uh, and again, I know it's it's a complicated question, but uh, this is our our Easter special. Uh, so I have to ask: uh, Do Muslims believe in some form of of Christ's resurrection? And uh, and what's uh, the, some of the the Ismaili take or Ismaili takes? Perhaps I should be saying. So uh, m again, the 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 majority of Muslims that that probably believe in the substitution theory, because he was never killed in that theory, there's no resurrection. Right. But they they await a second coming. They they await you know a a descent. This is most Muslims. Now I will say that people in the Sunni tradition today are challenging this. People are even challenging the idea of a literal second coming, you know, saying it doesn't really make sense. So, so there's a debate going on. I mean, you go on YouTube, you'll find sort of a back and forth between a, a more sort of traditional Sunni and a modernist Sunni and so on. Now, the Ismailis, with Ismailis, is more interesting because the, the, the historical death and crucifixion is fully affirmed. Uh, you don't, I have not found any reference to a bodily resurrection, but I found one reference where uh, the Ismaili philosopher who I quoted earlier, Abu Hatim Arazi, he, he dies, I think, in, in 934. So he's, you know, writing in the early 900s. So he, uh, he, he obviously, uh, he read the Bible, you know, clearly, because we quoted the Bible. And he refers to Jesus appearing to his disciples after his death. Right, so he refers to what what Christians would call post-resurrection appearances, uh, but according to him, those appearances is they are they they do not constitute a dead physical body coming back to life. Rather, uh, and this is an Ismaili belief generally, um, human souls even after the death of the physical body, uh, human souls retain a spiritual body called an imaginal body. So okay. this is a body that is material, but it's made up of a spiritual matter, which you could say has sort of visual form and shape, but it is not materially dense. So, so another term is subtle body. There are different terms for this within the Islamic tradition. And frankly, the uh, Ismailis are not the only people to believe in this type of, of bodily you know, spiritual bodily reality. Um, the Sufis believe in this. Islamic philosophers believe in this too. Uh, sometimes they call it the, you know, the, the body of imagination. The, the modern day new age term is astral body. So, you know, yeah. astral projection. Uh, and I will, I'll just add that uh, uh, this, I guess it's a coincidence. I'm not sure, but in the uh, NDE literature, people who ha who you know brain they go brain dead for like two minutes or three minutes uh they have a, a near-death experience during the time that they're clinically dead uh they describe that they left their physical body and they're sort of floating uh, but they're in another kind of body it's, and many of the, the first person accounts say like i was in another kind of body now I, I'm not making any judgment on whether that's true or false, but I'm saying that at a phenomenological level, uh, there seems to be widespread attestation, even among you know ordinary people, of a, a, a non-physical body. Yes. So what the Ismailis? It, it turns out that a thousand years ago, the Ismailis were talking about this. They were. They said everyone, every soul after death, will continue in this imaginal body. Uh, the Arabic term is khayal, or khayali body, or jism khayali would be the Arabic term. Uh, so Abu Hatim Arazi, the Ismaili philosopher, theologian, he says that Jesus in his khayal, in his imaginal body, he appeared to his disciples. So that would be, and, and he says it in passing, it's almost like not a non-controversial like thing for him to say. So he doesn't really go through this, but but that's what it seems to indicate. And and I think within an Ismaili Neoplatonic cosmology, um, this would be the interpretation of the post-resurrection appearances. And I'll just add that uh, 
and, and this is not a mainstream opinion, so so you don't quote me on it. But I know uh, the scholar um, James Tabor. Uh, he wrote this book, The Jesus Dynasty. He's written a lot about you know a new. He's giving sort of new takes on the historical Jesus and Abrahamic faith, and he has argued on his blog, uh, and I think in print that perhaps the earliest belief, the pre-Pauline belief, and maybe the Pauline belief in Jesus' resurrection was that the, the resurrection body, the body of resurrection of Jesus that appeared, was not understood as just a revived dead physical body, that perhaps it actually was understood as a spiritual body, and yeah because of time, over time, and sort of like in a broken telephone game, it was sort of anthropomorphized to, you know, being seen as a, a physical body back from the dead. Now, in either case, uh, and this plays to your next question, right? For, for traditional sort of, you know, Catholic Christianity, Orthodox Protestant Christianity, uh, Jesus' death on the cross is an atonement it's redemptive, right? It's it's a redemptive death. It's it's atonement for sin. I know there's different atonement theories, so I won't get into the details. But if if that's the case, then the resurrection has to be literal, right? Yeah. For for the whole uh, soteriology to work. Uh, but for Muslims, Jesus' death for the, those Muslims who believe in it. Again, it's the minority. Uh, but Jesus' death has no uh, redemptive nature. Right, so there's nothing at stake, like whether he resurrected or not, or whether it was a, a an imaginal body or a physical body. It really doesn't matter, uh, as far as you know, the Ismailis and, and really any Muslim is concerned. I frankly, a Muslim, uh, based on Muslim soteriology, could admit the crucifixion. They could even they could even affirm a literal resurrection. It would make no difference to uh, Islamic soteriology at all. If, because there's nothing at stake, because you don't have in Islamic thought, there's no original sin, so there's not there's you don't need a sacrificial death, and and the last thing I'll add is, I wonder, and, and one scholar named James Dunn, I think he recently passed away, but he's one of those sort of uh, historians of early Christianity, but he was also uh, a member of the clergy, like he's also like you know uh, like he's a practicing Christian. Um, I forget whether he's Methodist or Anglican, but like he's a member of the clergy as well. And James Dunn said in one of his later writings, it's in a book chapter, he suggested that the Jewish Christians, they would have understood the death of Jesus on the cross, not as redemption for sins, but as a covenant sacrifice. So the Passover sacrifice, that the lamb that that they that they slaughter on Passover, it's not a sin offering, yeah, right. It's just like a sign of the covenant. It's like it's blood shed for the covenant, you know, to sort of affirm the covenant, seal the covenant, renew the covenant. So James Dunn said that in the Jewish mindset, Jesus' death would not have been thought as a suffer an offering for sin, but it would have been seen as like a covenant renewal. Uh, sacrifice, which is which is different. So I guess there's a, a lot of sort of plurality uh, of of interpretation there. Yeah, and I think Margaret Barker, uh, she goes for that interpretation. And I think the Gospel of John and some of the other Gospels, which not all four of them have uh, a this this sort of uh, uh, redemption theology, if you read carefully. Um, and uh, I will just go back to talk about the subtle body just to point out, which I don't really need to because a, a lot of our listeners and viewers are familiar with esoteric Christianity, with the Hermetic tradition, with Kabbalah. They're going to be very familiar with the subtle body uh, and probably excited to find out that this is a, a common idea and found in, in many other faiths. And um, just to comment again on the, on the subtle body and its connections possibly to the resurrection, I, I think that that is the plain, straight up reading of Paul, that that is exactly what he's saying. And I find it very hard to interpret what he is saying about the resurrection in any other way. I think that is, he's rather direct that it is the subtle body uh, resurrection. It also makes me think of um, Father Francis to so 
uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but he, he's an Italian priest who's also a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism. And he studied these these lamas that upon their death, uh, the, uh, there's this uh, thing known as the rainbow body, which is very similar to the subtle body. And he made connections to that in the resurrection, saying that the rainbow body, the subtle body, and the resurrection body, they're all the same thing and perhaps uh, accessible to a wide range of people. Uh, but just, uh, just adding that in, uh, it is time to wrap up. Uh, uh, Dr. Andani, before I let you go, is, is there anything you want to plug, you, any websites or whatever? You can say them verbally, and I'll make sure to, to put them in the, the notes afterwards. Sure. I, I, I just want to say I, you had one, uh, the script you showed me. You had one last question Ooh. about holidays. Do oh, I do. have any holidays? So it's actually appropriate. So obviously, Ismailis don't celebrate Easter, right? Um, yeah. You know, Muslims don't celebrate Easter. But around Easter time, there is an occasion that is celebrated uh, in a widespread way across the Muslim world, especially in the Persian Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So Iran, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, these places, uh, even India, Pakistan. Uh, so the, the, the Persian Zoroastrian New Year, mm -hmm. right, which happens on March 21st, it's known as Nowruz, which means New Day. Uh, some people call it Navroz. Uh, that Persian Zoroastrian New Year, this is celebrated uh, among many Muslim communities, and Ismailis celebrate it as a religious occasion, hmm. right? Because this is like the the spring equinox, right? So, and and this is based on sort of the hermeneutics of nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, 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 this, and there's a lot to say, but the, the now ruse or the nav rose, uh, this symbolizes the spiritual. So physically speaking, this is spring. Uh, yeah. this is when nature is revived and resurrected. Yeah. Uh, so Ismailis see this as the natural symbolism, right? The natural indication of how the light of God via the universal intellect, the universal soul, and the imam of the time, the light of God via these intermediaries, via the perfect human, how that light resurrects the human soul. It lum the human soul, just like, you know, the darkness of winter gives way to the light of the sun, where there's now growth and renewal. Likewise, uh, Nauruz or Navroz for the believer, it symbolizes this moment of spiritual attainment when the light of the Imam, you know, resurrects, revives, uh, spiritually speaking, uh, the, the souls of the souls of his disciples and, and, you know, human beings in general. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. That, that's a, that's an interesting parallel because of course, some people who aren't scholars will, will say we, we know that that there probably was a historical Jesus. We we you know speaking scholarly, like as a scholar, you can't say that much about him, right? He taught and he was crucified. You know, if you're going to make three, if you're going to say three definite statements about Jesus as a historian, it's that he existed, <laughs> that he taught, and that he was crucified. Um, and we know that he was crucified around Passover, and of course Easter is close to Passover, so the the timing is actually historical. Now you'll see some memes online saying uh, that uh, Christians stole Easter from from pagan spring celebrations, right? Not true. But that said, just like what you're saying, Christians would see this as 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 a natural expression of of the symbolism of of the divine will, sort of syncing these things up. And of course, it's very easy for for a Christian uh, to look at the resurrection of Jesus, the return of the light. Look around them; it's springtime. The earth itself is coming back to life. Everything around you is resurrecting. So that that is a fascinating parallel. And uh, yeah, and I'm I'm sorry I forgot that question because I'm really glad that you brought that up that's uh and it is interesting to see um sometimes how you know i've talked about we find these similarities in in, in our traditions because they are drinking from the same well right and particularly neoplatonism but of course sometimes they're not but it, there's there's just a way that the religious and particularly esoteric 
uh, mind works, also backed up by experiences that seem to make these connections. So very, very fascinating stuff. Um, okay, so sorry, uh, the, uh, your plugs, uh, and as a, and I'll, I'll throw them in the uh, in the show notes below, so uh, people can can find you or follow up on any of the the the, the fascinating, interesting stuff that we we talked about. Yeah, so uh, you could uh, follow me on uh, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, which is just basically my name. Uh, you know, uh, so I have a YouTube channel. I with several, a lot of videos, so you can subscribe to that. Um, I'm on Twitter again under under my own name, and uh, I don't know uh, how many of you are on there, but uh, I've I'm on Clubhouse, uh, and and I don't know if you guys are not on Clubhouse, uh, John, you guys should join Clubhouse. You I could not. create so you could create a club on yeah. there. It's an it, it's it's an app. Uh, right now, I think it's for for the iPhone, but um, you download it, uh, it. You sort of join rooms, discussion rooms. And you talk to people. There's no camera involved, which is the best part. So you can, you know, be in pajamas. And 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 I, I'm telling you the the, the type of discussions uh, that are going on about gnosis, about spirituality, about philosophy. You know, it's it's uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, I've I was just in a room earlier, and I was learning all about the philosophy of language and and concepts. And and another room was about metaphysics, and another room was about they had. Uh, um, uh, what's it, Donald uh, Hoffman, uh, who's who's done work on consciousness, for example. Uh, you know, so they've had all all sorts of things going on. So you guys could create a club on Clubhouse. So I'm on Clubhouse. So you, if you're on there, you could follow me, and you can have entire rooms with me and others talking about uh, this sort of stuff. And I have a personal website, which is just my name dot uh, com. So Perfect. I'd be happy to hear from any any of your viewers who, who uh, want to learn more. And I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me on uh, again. Uh, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, you you sort of sharing uh, you know the similar perspective uh, from your tradition. I think that really enriched uh, this conversation. Oh, thank you. I do too. And it, it's been really awesome having you on and we'll have to do it again someday. And uh, I'm definitely, yeah, I'm definitely going to start a talk gnosis clubhouse and I'm definitely going to check out yours. And uh, I do see you out there on social media, literally doing God's work on those hell sites. So thank you for your service. I see you on Twitter uh, and uh, fighting the good fight. So, um, but yeah, it, it's been awesome. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.